Dear friends, welcome. Uh, we are very pleased and honored uh, to host uh, Douglas Woodring, uh, the founder and the manager of the Ocean Recovery Alliance that has been uh, working on the health of oceans. And today he will be talking about the plastic pollution, a very important environmental issue um, that needs uh, utmost attention. So this event is a joint one with Boğaziçi University and WWF Turkey. And uh, I'm now asking uh, Urbe Urbayar, the chairman of the foundation, um, to um, welcome and present Douglas. Urbe. Çok teşekkürler hocam. I had prepared my opening remarks in, in Turkish, but uh, I was pleasantly surprised <laughs> to be told to, to, to make that in English in the last minute. So I'm, I'm actually uh, simultaneously translating my <laughs> opening remarks to English as we speak. Um, first of all, uh, good afternoon. It's, it's a great pleasure uh, being here um, in this wonderful institution. Um, I am the chairman of WWF Turkey for the last eight years. As you know, uh, you, may, you may or may not know, uh, World Wildlife Foundation uh, is, is uh, the world's largest and I think oldest uh, environmental organization. Um, we are the Turk, uh, national organization as Doğal Hayatı Koruma Vakfı. We are the national organization of uh, WWF. We've actually just celebrated our 40th year uh, this year. So. Uh, we're 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 actually uh, very privileged and honored uh, honored to to be representing WWF in Turkey. Um, this week, uh, and actually Doug's presence here coincided with uh, uh, the Earth Hour, uh, which we every year uh, observe, uh, along with many other countries. Um, Tomorrow, 8:30 uh, p.m., uh, major iconic buildings, uh, mosques, uh, stadiums, uh, uh, bridges will turn off their lights uh, for one hour to uh, to increase um, uh, visibility uh, to, to to this event. Um, one of the major, um, obviously, uh, fights and struggles that uh, we are we are preoccupied in Turkey. Uh, Along, along with the world, uh, is the threat to, to biodiversity. And uh, one of the biggest threats to biodiversity is plastic. We've actually announced this year as WWF Turkey the year of plastic. Um, it, is, it is so acute and so horrifying that uh, every year 8 million uh, tons of plastic end up in the oceans. Um, every one fish out of five has some sort of plastic uh, in their digest digestive system. So as we eat them, as the other uh, uh, organisms eat them, uh, they actually end up in our digestive system as well. It is truly, truly horrifying. Uh, Turkey uh, is actually uh, is not an, at a desirable place in the world leagues of uh, recycling and, and mismanagement, mismanaged plastic waste. We are on the 14th uh, place uh, among the OECD countries uh, and, and uh, again in, in, in the very sort of last uh, places in the, in the uh, global recycling league. Uh, I think one of the most uh, important focus points of ours will be, uh, our, of our campaign this year, we'll, we'll try to stop the, the use of single-use plastic. Uh, and we are uh, trying to uh, put in mechanisms with municipalities, with uh, uh, governmental organizations to put in places, uh, to, to put in place um, some mechanisms to, to, uh, to stop single-use um, plastic and to, to uh, uh, regain plastic before they end up in our oceans and in our waters. Uh, in this, uh, in this, I want to call it fight. Uh, we are uh, cooperating very intimately with uh, Boaz University, and, and we're grateful to for, for that. Uh, we have in our WWF team 
many uh, wonderful Boazici uh, alumni. Um, and we would obviously like all of you to, to give us uh, any support uh, in, in your own capacities. Um, at this point, uh, I wanted to thank uh, uh, our rector, uh, Mehmet Özkan, uh, our uh, uh, intimate member of our team, uh, Professor Fikret Adaman, for always being there uh, with us, and introduce um, Doug uh, Woodring and welcome him to Turkey. Doug actually has been in Turkey for the last week, has made many speeches uh, in uh, Koç Lisesi, Koç University, in Özyen Üniversitesi, Turmepa, Olympic Committee, and Çevko, and, and lastly, he has, I think, a great pleasure to, to address you. Doug is uh, the founder and managing director of Ocean Recovery Alliance, which is a uh, non-profit organization which focuses on bringing innovative sol solutions, technology, collaborations, and policy together to encourage positive imp improvements for the health of the ocean. I want to call him the guru of oceans. He is also the founder of, or guru of plastics, I must say. <laughs> he is also the founder of Plasticity Forum with a unique business focus on the future of plastic sustainability and how solutions, innovations, materials, and opportunities can be scaled for a world with a reduced waste footprint. In 2009, he was recognized as a United Nations Environment Climate Hero for his efforts to raise awareness on the plastic footprint on human beings. He is born in Northern California and uh, holds a dual uh, master's degree from the Wharton School and Johns Hopkins University, where he studied environmental economics. Doug also has a BA in economics and political science from the University of California at Berkeley. We are truly, truly privileged to have you here. The floor is yours, Doug. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, great pleasure to be here at Bosphorus University. It's, a, it's an amazing campus, reminds me a lot of Berkeley. And uh, very pr proud to be able to address all of you here on a beautiful Friday spring afternoon. Um, I'd also like to thank John and Leila Suzar, who are at Coach High School, and they were really instrumental in bringing me here. It's their midterm week or their exam week, but uh, Leila's here in the audience today. and. You know, if it wasn't for their inspiration, I, I probably wouldn't be here this week. So I'm going to talk today. Uh, please try to think of your toughest and hardest questions for me, uh, because this is an uber challenge for the planet. Uh, it is super complex, and a lot of people are only just getting into the whole thought process of what did we do now that we just woke up that this has been happening to us for the last 40 or 50 years since we invented this material. Um, I got my, uh, my, well, step back a bit. I grew up in California and uh, I had no intention to run an NGO. I did go to Wharton. I was in finance. I'm not a scientist. I am not a biologist. I'm basically an environmental entrepreneur uh, with a weird background of MBA and uh, international relations. But I guess because of that, I'm, I'm able to dance between the different categories of industry and people and government and sort of translate that, which I think is a critical tool. Uh, Al Gore and some of the climate scientists on climate change, uh, translation from science to the general public is incredibly necessary. And I would say very much at, at uh, at a very low level of uh, capacity this, this day and age. Uh, marketing, media, that's all important. So I did a lot of swimming, uh, windsurfing, paddling, diving, all these water sports. And so I would see the water a lot more than other people saw it. And when I moved to Asia, coming from a clean place of California, I said, oh my gosh, why is there so much air pollution? Why is there so much stuff here? And how come these people haven't you know, figured this out yet, and that sort of aggravated me. And then I was also working as the first white person in a, probably the biggest Japanese fishing company in the world, trading seafood. And if anyone's ever been to Skiji Fish Market, you see <coughs> the enormity of what comes out of the ocean every single day from every corner of the planet in that market the size of about eight or nine football fields. And I, you know, that's just one market, the biggest, but there's many thousands of those around the world. 
And the world has been taking this stuff out of the ocean at such scale without us really noticing that we're doing that because we can't see what is out there. And that stuck with me. So I said to myself, I want to slow that down. I want to make the ocean better someday when I get older and I have some capacity to do something. <clears throat> and I somehow got into this plastic world and didn't really expect to go in that direction. But here I am today, about 10 years later, still doing it. And uh, I think we're seeing progress, so that's good. So I call this the plastic that binds the planet. And that's for two reasons. One is that all of us use plastic. Every company needs plastic. Every industry needs plastic. And there's no way for us to just say, ban plastic, let's go back to live in a cave and have a nice life. Impossible. So we have to figure out how to deal with plastic in the afterlife. The afterlife is when it's bad. The afterlife is after it's used for the first time once you intended to use it. And the problem is in things like single-use items that you talked about, <coughs> this material, which is super lightweight and super durable and super malleable, is definitely not meant to just dissolve and go away and go back into nature that is not produced in that manner. And then we have a material <coughs> that is rigid and carries air and becomes very voluminous. So when you're talking about the volume of a ton of plastic bottles, if you didn't compress it, it would be the size of half of this room filled with air. Totally inefficient. Totally inefficient use of a permanent material for a disposable or short life product. And that's the challenge that we face <coughs> in this space today. I can't have that be seen on my table. <laughs> um, so why did we get to where we are today? Psychologically, I think what happened is when the world was doing exploration and we were going to Mount Everest and all of these peaks, high, low, deep, far away, <coughs> Jacques Picard and Don Walsh went to the bottom of the Mariana Trench off of the Philippines and went down in their submersible 10,800 meters, looked out the window, saw a bunch of black silt, came up, celebrated, said, we just broke the world record in the ocean, and everyone said, oh, that's great, ocean's, ocean's conquered, everyone's, so they've already broken the record, no need to spend time there. Kennedy comes along and says, we're going to space because Russia's coming, and we got to put all our money up there. And pretty much that's what has happened. Now, of course, we've learned a lot, and we know satellites, and we learn about the Earth and space, but there's no way that we can get ourselves up to drive that Tesla that might end up on Mars someday. Uh, that's just been sent up there. There's no way we can do any of that in our lifetime. <laughs> and if you think it's good for your kids to want to do it, that's only because we will have already polluted the self, ourselves out of our own nation and country before that. Otherwise, there's no reason to even try to go there. <clears throat> so the problem is we have two-thirds of the world's surface, which is the ocean, in the water, totally unexplored, totally exploited, totally forgotten about in relative terms of money. And that's why we face the problems we have today with overfishing, pollution, all of these good things, and plastic. <clears throat> and now the ocean is getting a revival, and people are saying, wow, we got to come back. It's good for oxygen. It's good for this. Half of the world's oxygen is made by the ocean. Half of it. So every two breaths you take is partly ocean-related. <clears throat> and we can get into that later. So this image is maybe something you've seen. It's, it's a bad image. It's from Jakarta. It makes us ask, as part of nature, which doesn't pollute anything because it all is a circular system that builds on itself, why did we come along and start making these materials that are <coughs> prefabricated polymers that all of a sudden allow us to pollute? We might not want to mean to pollute, but we are. One person I saw, uh, only one, when I've shown this before, he said, that picture is a gold mine. I said, oh, why did you say that? Because there's value in all of that. And I said, that is exactly right. The problem is, if you don't have the resources and the technology and the equipment to turn it to value, it's not valuable. And that's the challenge of the world today. What is interesting in this picture is that there is something happening here economically. This boy is picking up straws. The reason he's picking up straws is because someone in that environment said, I'll pay you for that material 
if you get that stuff. And that is enough to trigger <coughs> that circular system that we all need. And we need, to we need to collectively be putting, figuring out how to get value on this later on, whether that's for energy, fuel, or some kind of recycling, <coughs> it doesn't matter. Why do we sociologically have, in, unfortunately in some countries, the fail to react to some of this stuff? The shifting baseline is such that when the young people are now growing up and they go to the beach, this is the norm. They don't ask a question. They don't call someone and say there's a problem. They don't try to pick it up because they think it's someone else's job. This was in Hong Kong where I lived two years ago when there was basically a solidified oil spill that came across from the Pearl River Delta. And all these people still went to the beach and went clamming and had a nice day. That is a societal problem that we face, which relates to education and, and other issues. <coughs> if you look at the scientific studies that show uh, what the, where the world has gone in terms of boundaries and overstepping our capacities, some say we've already overstepped three, and we really can't go back from that, actually. One is with climate change, one is biodiversity loss, which was already mentioned, and the other is with nitrogen and, uh, and, and the stuff we use for agriculture. And when, that, when those boundaries are crossed, we're now going into a new space, a never-never land that we don't really know. Whether that's from pollution, over hunting, over feeding, exploitation, you know, this is, a, this is a new zone that we're moving into. So going back to waste, if you think, if you want to just visualize how much do we all make, in a year in garbage in our houses and our companies, not construction waste. Uh, this looks a bit like a seahorse, but it's Japan. And imagine 10 meters, which is even higher than this room, covering Japan every year in waste. That's what the world makes. Most of the world has no capacity whatsoever to handle that today. There's some countries that have a lot of incineration that has to be part of the mix for energy, but a lot of places don't have that. If you look at the population growth estimates, some people think the world will get more populous. Others think it will get less because the world will regulate itself. We'll find out in the next 30 years. But if it grows, there'll be more consumption. There'll be more spending. There'll be more packaging. There'll be more wealth created. And there'll be more waste. And then we'll cover all of Japan, Spain, and New Zealand with 10 meters of waste. And that is the Uber challenge. Huge opportunity for all of you who are in this space, maybe thinking to go into wind turbines, solar power, or something sexy. <clears throat> but the reason we have the problem today is because waste is not sexy. And there's no Elon Musks who've even entered the market to even think about this issue yet. So this picture, does anyone know what this might depict? This graph looks just like the carbon graph of 20 years ago when Al Gore was running around showing the growth of carbon. <clears throat> this is the growth of plastic and the consumption of plastic since the 1960s. So as we've got better molding and cheaper, cheaper materials, all of a sudden we're going on a trajectory like this. <clears throat> this flat line is where the disaster has come and that is the infrastructure and investment in waste and recycling capacity globally. And this is why we have a big problem today because there's nothing there to fill the void. So when you look at um, what the way a lot of cities and municipalities have done contracts with their landfillers is that they've <coughs> made the contract for 10 or 20 years. And there's no incentive clause in there for them to do anything better. In fact, in Hong Kong, incredibly, I hate to blame who it might have been, but it was the British who were running the territory at that time, they made it illegal to have recycling on the same site as a landfill. So the landfill operator has zero incentive to do something different and get recovery of that material. So if you have a 30-year contract or even 20 and it can't be changed and you won the contract, you're going to go play golf for 30 years and just wait for the dump trucks to come in and take your garbage because then you just get paid. And that is the problem we have, the waste world today. <coughs> this is a picture of GDP, sorry, uh, so this is unsound waste disposal. That means 
bad garbage handling. That's open pit burning, burning in your front yard, throwing in the gutter, uh, illegal landfills, all the bad things you know, where stuff gets lost. Basically says, <coughs> the richer the country you are, the less you're going to have unsound disposal because you have trucks, you have bins, you have capacity to gather and collect everything, but here's most of the world. <coughs> this is a similar graph, but it's for recycling. So the more money you have as a country, the more capacity you have to recycle because you have trucks and bins and <laughs> recycling facilities, sorting facilities, and this is where most of the world is on recycling. Or they shipped it to China. Has anyone heard about the ban that China's put up in January uh, on un unprocessed waste to China? I think it's the best thing that's ever happened to the planet. It's the biggest shock that's ever happened to the planet on waste. It is like a big land-based tsunami that most of the West has no idea is coming to its shores. Because all of these countries used to just export their garbage in the form of recycling to China because it was cheaper to do it. The guys in Australia, the guys in the US, the guys in Europe said, oh, it's too expensive for me to sort the garbage, probably because they didn't sort it the right way at the beginning. And we're not going to process here, but China is growing fast and they need to put in their machines, so they're going to take it. Well, now China finally said no, 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 because it's polluting our rivers, it's polluting our stuff, there's a lot of illegal, illegal things. Sorry, you guys keep it at home. So now we're going to have a huge <coughs> challenge and the needed investment and innovation in the onshoring of dealing with our own waste in a domestic manner. About 40% of the world's waste gets burned just in the front yard because they don't want it in their garden. Uh, that causes a lot of problems. That's carbon black, which is bad for climate because it absorbs heat in the soot and also the pollution in the air, whether it's immediate uh, breathing of the gases from the plastic or it goes up into the sky and gets rained into the water, the soil, the air, the ocean, everything. And that's what then creates a toxic circulation. So this is also an issue. And then this is the challenge, is how do we get this stuff to be valuable <clears throat> so that someone in the society says, oh, I'm going to collect that because I can take it to him or her and they, they'll pay me a little bit so I could turn it to this, that, or the other, or fuel. And this is where we need the technologies and machinery. So I got started in this about um, 2008 when the world crisis was happening on the financial crisis, I, s I learned about this. I was working on wave energy, and I learned about this big plastic place in the middle of the ocean. And I said, how come no one, I never heard about that? And how come no one's doing something about it and studying it? So we co-funded, we got organized enough money to do an expedition to the North Pacific Gyre, which is about 1,000 miles off California, 1,000 miles from Hawaii. And we were the first group because we brought Scripps Oceanography with us on this trip. And it was the first time ever that real science had gotten done in the gyre. Before that, it was sort of NGO science. And the, the industry could then say, oh, it's not really real. You didn't do the right policy. You didn't really do the right studies. Go study some more and waste a bit more time until we figure out what it is. So we went out with Scripps. And as soon as they put up the data, the industry said, oh, uh, okay, now we got to figure out what's going to be happening here. So we found out that it's not a big island, but we did find plastic in every single sample for a thousand miles. It wasn't like you were out on a safari looking for an endangered species and you maybe find a footprint after three weeks of hunting. We found this immediately from the beginning and all the way through to the end, and it's like a big plastic soup. So we were the first group to ever test uh, fish down to 700 meters and that was important because we found that some of the fish that only live at three or four hundred meters and they don't come up to feed actually had plastic in their stomach. The scientists figure they have 10 percent of them have plastic and I thought mm, that's not really a big number. It's, uh, it cycles through them, probably doesn't kill them. <clears throat> but when they calculated the population of those fish in the zone that we tested they said, oh, well, if 10% are eating the plastic t -t 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 calculation, then they're eating 12 to 24,000 tons of plastic a year, microplastic. And that made it into the New York Times. And that was uh, an in number just also showed the three dimensionality of this issue. Now, we also went down and used these CTDs 
to test water samples at 500 meters deep. Each one of these closes at a certain depth, and the hole is only about this big, like a softball. And by accident, we got a piece of plastic in one of those tubes at 200 meters deep and one at 160 meters deep, which, thinking about it, should, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean with a hole this big, should never, ever, 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 ever happen. And it did. So therefore, there's a whole idea of the three-dimensionality of the water column all the way down to the bottom, because two-thirds of all plastic actually sinks, even from the beginning. If this, if this water bottle went into the ocean, didn't have a top on it and no air, it will sink. And most people don't think about that because they see it floating because it's got air in it. And so two-thirds already, as soon as it hits the water, will go to the bottom. So th we're really talking about the tip of the iceberg, literally. What happens with plastic is it doesn't biodegrade, it breaks down by the sun, gets brittle, uh, and the problem is this plastic in the ocean becomes a carrier to other toxins. Pla toxins like DDT, PCB, fire retardant, pesticide, they like, uh, they like petroleum material, they grab onto it more than water. And then when this goes into a fish, that fatty tissue is more likely, because it's oil, could suck out the toxin from that little pellet, the pellet goes through the fish. So think of these as the carriers. This doesn't happen on the land because they don't get absorbed by the, the water. So some studies have shown a million times more toxins on this outside than the normal water, uh, water content. And so that is a transfer agent also for invasive species. Almost all plastic that go, co goes across the ocean has life on it whether it's uh, algae, fish eggs, barnacles, crabs, and those things catch a free ride across the ocean until they go to a new late location and then try to establish their colony, and they shouldn't be there because that's not their territory. And so that is a huge other issue, but almost, almost impossible to solve that one. Has anyone seen this picture, the albatross? Probably you have. Uh, baby albatross from Midway Island, the middle of the Pacific, not near any human beings. The mothers and father albatross fly around, look for food. They find these colorful things on the water. They eat it, bring it back, and they regurgitate it to the babies. The babies get a full stomach, but there's no, uh, there's no nutrition in the stomach, and they die. And this is one of the only places, birds are at least, easy way to count uh, wildlife impacts with plastic in the ocean because in the ocean there's no body count. There's no way for us to know how many whales died, how many seals died, how many other fish died because we don't see them unless they just happen to have landed on a coast and we happen to open their stomach. 20 years ago we never opened stomachs to see what's in it. We just buried the thing and get it away from the public uh, beach but now they open every whale Every single whale has plastic and nets and some things in it, almost every animal. So there's 1,200 animals that get impacted by uh, plastic, either chemically, which is the little guys, or uh, physically, which is something around their neck, entanglement, or in their stomach causes big problems. That's just for ocean-related animals. But how many have seen a dog or a cat? or a bird eat a piece of plastic on the land. They think it smells like food, it's colorful, goes in their mouth. Every animal will do it. Cow, dog, pig, horse, goat, giraffe. And this is a good example of one from Dubai <coughs> with a camel. So I'm here with Marcus Erickson from Five Gyres. We're at the Monterey Bay Aquarium after a great uh, event on plastic pollution for aquariums. And we got an amazing piece of uh, uh, treasure here from Marcus. Marcus, what is this? So this is a, a camel gastrolith. Uh, it was in the, the deserts in Dubai. I met a veterinarian and said, you know, let's just walk out of the water, go in the desert. Went to the top of this ridge, looked over this, this ridge, and we saw piles of white bones. Each was a bleached camel skeleton. In the middle of each one was trash. So inside of a camel stomach, this gastrolith was found. It's, I estimate, 150, 200 plastic bags and rope. It's all calcified together, you can see here. Uh, that was in the camel's gut. And, and the veterinarian said it kills camels in three ways. It toxifies them because the folds of the bags hold bacteria. It, uh, it creates blockages. And also, the mass of it dehydrates them. They feel they're full when they're not. They, they, they lose weight, they dehydrate, and they die. 
so that's uh, yeah, a tough example. Um, re recently, the whole plastic pollution issue has gotten a lot louder. Literally in six months, every month it seems to get louder. David Attenborough and Blue Planet, I'm going to show you a clip, has really made a big impact in the UK from this one scene. So it shows you the power of media and storytelling and, and how these things can make a difference. This one maybe needs a bit more audio. A mother is holding her newborn young. It's dead. She is reluctant to let it go and has been carrying it around for many days. In top predators like these, industrial chemicals can build up to lethal levels. And plastic could be part of the problem. As plastic breaks down, it combines with these other pollutants that are consumed by vast numbers of marine creatures. It's possible her calf may have been poisoned by her own contaminated milk. Pilot whales have big brains. They can certainly experience emotions. Judging from the behavior of the adults, the loss of the infant has affected the entire family. Unless the flow of plastics and industrial pollution into the world's oceans is reduced, marine life will be poisoned by them for many centuries to come. So effectively, this is what we've been doing to the ocean. Now, this might not literally be pollution, it just might be silt, but uh, all the agricultural waste, plastic. We used to think that the solution to pollution is dilution. That's what uh, a lot of people said. The ocean's so big, if we put it out there, it will just go away, it will sink, and we won't notice where it is, and then, th then it's gone. Now we realize, especially with this material that doesn't go away, is that that's not the case. So there's now about 450 dead zones around the world's waters, uh, Mississippi being the biggest one going into the Gulf of Mexico because of agriculture pollutants and, and also um, pest, not only pesticides, but uh, fertilizers and things to help it grow. And that causes plankton and, and uh, algae to bloom in, in the ocean, taking away the oxygen. So that impacts all of the reefs and the, all of the people who need to live <coughs> along the coastline. If you believe in climate change and maybe a water rising, maybe big storms, big floods, these people are super unresilient, especially when they don't have mangroves that protect from storms, when their reefs are been dynamited out for short-term fishing gains, when they don't have any way for those fish to grow, 25% of all the world's fish come from reefs, and that is being impacted both by dynamiting, also pollution, also acidification. That's a different issue, but how are we gonna deal with all these people? Well, they decide to go inland because they have no resources on the coast, and there's climate changed or environmentally changed problems. <laughs> Overfishing is a huge issue. Um, there's $32 billion worth of subsidies that go from governments into fishing boats to basically own military type equipment that can hunt for more and more fish deeper and deeper out, farther and farther away, and smaller and smaller species because now 85% of all the world's big species are already gone. And now we're going for the things even in uh, markets like off of Chile where the Chinese are now hunting looking for squid 
which no one ever used to hunt for squid on a commercial level off of Chile. And that just shows you that things are shifting. The Chinese government has found this to be such a serious issue. They used to give two weeks, two months moratorium off the shores of China and say, you guys can't fish for two months to give the little wildlife a chance to grow back. This year it was four and a half months, putting over four million people out of work. And for China to do that is like uh, a nuclear attack on that country. They now realize they have a big issue. One of the best examples of a no-take zone is uh, Somalia because it's illegal to, not illegal, but you don't want to fish there because the pirates originally started pirating because their little fisheries were getting encroached by the European and Asian fisheries that were just sucking all the fish out of Somalia. So they went out there with a few guns and they figured out they could get onto some bigger boats and do some bigger things. But now no one fishes there and now Kenya's getting a very good fish because the ocean has rejuvenated. And if we give it a chance, it will do that. But it's worth remembering that a billion people need to survive on seafood every day, some kind of protein. They don't have the choices that we have. And that most of the world's overfishing is not from them and their parents with a pole and line and a little rowboat. It's from all the big boats that go to serve our restaurants and our retail outlets. So we have a choice between chicken, meat, fish, lobster, halibut, and whatever that is. So, you know, think twice about when you're getting that fish, <coughs> if you can. Does anyone know, other than Soupy, about the broken windows theory? Anyone heard of this? Because this is very relevant. Um, Basically, it came out of New York in the 70s when there was a lot of crime in the Bronx and the Harlem, a lot of bad things happening, windows broken everywhere, trains are just destroyed with graffiti. And then someone said, a sociological expert said, well, let's make it look nice. And if it looks nice, people are going to take care of it. They're going to feel proud of where they live. So they painted the windows, they fixed the windows, painted the house, painted the train. All of a sudden, people are not so they start self-policing. They're not going to be the first guy to throw the rock through the window. They're not going to be the first one to paint the train. People feel proud of where they live. The property price goes up a bit. And I just heard this story yesterday, almost the same thing in Ankara with the new subway. Up above on the ground, very dirty. People maybe not paying attention to where they are, what they're doing. But as soon as the subway opened, people went down there and immediately started to want to keep it clean because it was clean. And that is a very interesting social example. So if you think of rivers and trash, which most people think of trash as just an aesthetic bad thing, not going to cause a lot of harm, <coughs> well, let's think of the rivers as the broken windows, and let's think of the clean ones as the ones we're going to fix. So this is in Manila. <coughs> they, they, they admit they have a problem, all the barangays, all the creeks. But they've cleaned some of them, and they OK, the water's not perfect. But what they've done is they got all the trash out. So that means that the person with that trash bag that usually was going to throw it into the water is now not going to throw it in the water because they don't want to be caught. And now the people are proud to be living along this. And now you can have a dialogue with those people and say, OK, now we're going to spend a little bit more money to fix the sewage system. Or now we're going to spend a little bit money to get the water a bit cleaner. You know how we can do it before. Let's go to the next step. They say, oh, that's good. Now you've proven to us that we fixed this broken window. Let's fix the next one. So let's think of our rivers that way. If you look at climate change today, <coughs> some places will get it. Some places don't get it. We don't know where it's going to show up. But trash impacts probably billions of people every day. Water, health, sanitation, tourism, agriculture, fishing. All of this is just something that leaves our hand because we didn't have the right place to put it into the system.
so that shows two things. One, it shows that companies are now switching on a little bit to, to figure out that they can use recycled content in their products to sell things. But also shows that some people have pride and that we can have pride in the areas that we live and can think about chasing that thing down the hill if it goes down the hill in the first place. So one of the programs we announced at the Clinton Global Initiative a few number of years ago is called the Global Alert Platform. It allows you to report trash hot spots anywhere in the world's waters. It was partly funded by the World Bank. It's already in Spanish. We need all of you to go out and start using it because it puts ha power in the hands of you to tell people in that watershed or community anywhere in the world that there are these zones that need to be fixed. We got very lucky. We uh, launched this last year, two years ago at Earth Day. Uh, in New York, Times Square, Morgan Stanley uh, let us use their big screen for 30 days to talk about trash. While all of Times Square is buzzing with the commercial messages, there is this incredible encounter of Ocean Recovery Alliance really making aware of the state of the oceans. It's especially nice to be able to have the Global Alert app on the Morgan Stanley wall here in Times Square. I was looking at the screen and I learned the fact that by 2050 there might be more plastic in the oceans than fish. 20 years ago when I was in Bali I got inspired unfortunately by the amount of trash that was on the beaches and today the opening shot on the screen is actually an image of the beautiful water in Bali with trash floating on the top of it. I grew up in the Dominican Republic. The rivers were always polluted with plastic and other substances and all that trickled down to the ocean and the deltas. As human beings we have to change the way that we produce, we have to change the way that we consume and we have to change the way that we interact with our world, especially in the way that we produce plastics and the way that we turn that plastic into a positive resource. Global Alert allows you to see, share and solve problems of trash in our waterways and the ocean. It allows you to take three photos anywhere in the world, wherever you go, download this app and you can get information, put the pin on the area where the trash is, and stakeholders in that community can then make better managed decisions to clean up, prevent, and stop trash from getting into our waters. I founded Make a Change Bali in 2009 to basically clean up Bali, um, the beaches, the rivers. So with an app like this, I can just go out and literally just geotag areas around the island. It's an amazing opportunity for us, and I think the change is about to happen. So if you think of rivers as uh, blood vessels and think of the ocean as the heart, then think of cholesterol as the plastic. And you don't want the cholesterol to go to the heart in the ocean. It's much easier to collect that cholesterol if it's here in the blood vessels than if it's um, out here in the middle and it's already sunk. So uh, the whole idea with this is to use the power of those locations to get the watershed caretakers, whether it's government, university, rotary club, doesn't matter, who's taking care of that zone, get a few people reporting and say, oh, we need to put booms and nets in those kind of areas and manage what's coming out in the first place. If you think of uh, the coastline of the world, most people would say, ah, if, if a teacher asks you to draw a line with take, without taking your pencil off the map from Hong Kong to China to uh, Beijing, most kids would put the pencil down here, go right up the coastline, past Shanghai to Beijing, and that's the coastline. There's 217,000 miles of that traditional coastline. But when you really think about it, the smart kid gets up there, says, no, that's not right. You have to go on to Hong Kong, and you go up to Shanghai, you have to turn left all the way up the Yangtze River to the headwaters in Tibet of the Yangtze River, do a U-turn and come down the other river bank and then go left at Shanghai to Beijing. That is the coastline of the world. And if you add the 20 biggest rivers of the world together, you get 87,000 more miles of coastline. If you add all the tributaries, all that is trillions of miles. So when we're having an issue and a discussion about oceans and ocean plastic, usually 100% of the time, they never talk about fresh water. If you go to a water conference, they will talk about desertification and rivers and uh, droughts. They will never talk about the ocean.
but this links all of these people to the ocean, even if they don't want to be linked, they still want their water here to be clean. And so the problem in this ocean story of protecting our plastic is someone says, oh, yeah, I heard about that problem there, but I don't go to the ocean. I don't go there with my kids, maybe once a year. It's not my problem. But this is a land-based problem. 80% of everything that is in here comes from land. There's nothing in the ocean pollution story that has anything to do with a solution that comes from the ocean, unless you make plastic from algae, which is now starting to come. But the ocean is not going to solve our plastic problem. This is purely a land-based problem, and it's industry and municipalities and everything we do upstream. The ocean is just a downstream benefactor. So this gives people a chance to run around the world. If you're traveling, biking, walking your dog, it doesn't matter. You can fly into any uh, geo on the map, Google Earth, and protect the watershed. Now, this, this app doesn't go call the watershed people and say, hey, it's time for you to fix it, because we don't know all these people. It's up to the local community to get engaged and link your knowledge to the watershed guy or the Rotary Club or whoever that is and say, look, we just reported this with our high school. And now these points are real. Look, here's how big it is. What are you going to do about it? You can't hide. You need to get engaged in either doing a cleanup or some kind of program to put up a boom in a net and catchment device. With three photos and some basic data that you visually can take, it gives the stakeholders a chance to sit at their computer if they really want to and not even go out and manage what is happening out there. We, we vet all the photos before they go live <coughs> just to make sure there's no dirty pictures there uh, because if there's bad pictures that are irrelevant to the stakeholder, they won't use it. So we want to make sure it is about trash and that a, and a watershed supplies manager or a sewage manager or a minister of tourism will look at this and say, oh my God, this is not good to be on a map. Now, if you do a cleanup, you can also go on a website and put the cleanup pictures and a green pin will come up and then they can be proud and say, oh, look, we dealt with it. Now, of course, two weeks later, the tide might come and the water might come. You might have it again, but at least you can start a management system like that. So what we really want to inspire is these kind of catchment devices. This one happens to not be in the third world, although it could become the third world. It's three miles from the White House in the U.S. And this is a water stream that is going down. Some of you guys didn't catch that joke. Um, <laughs> the water's going under here. All of the plastic comes up on there. Easy for a school to recycle it, except for the fire extinguisher. But at least it didn't go into the water. Okay, this could probably be made with bamboo or wood in, in uh, Philippines or Vietnam or something. Or you do something really simple like we're, school we're working with in Bali to use trash to catch, tr catch trash. And they make a boom, like a sausage, put some, something that floats in it, something that's a bit heavy to give it a little depth, put a wire on it, and then you go out. Obviously, it depends on the speed of the water, but this is effective to catch stuff going downstream. And then people start thinking, oh, where'd that come from? And where, oh, what could I do with that now? If you just let it go right by, people just say, oh, my water's clean. But it's not clean. So this is what we want to inspire. This is a huge engineering potential for any industry, university, country to get involved in all the different sizes of equipment that are high and low tech, depending on the water system, the size of the water system. Uh, this is a very pretty simple one. It's in Malaysia. They don't even have a uh, wire mesh on it. It's just a fence line. But these guys <coughs> come every single day, pick up one to 200 kilos of trash. It's funded by Heineken because Heineken has a plant just nearby. So the corporates get involved. And it's a bit like adopt a highway in the US, adopt a river, adopt a creek. Why not have a school do the reporting on a creek or a coastline? And then we start thinking about what we can do with this material. Could it become valuable somehow? Could we then figure out how to recycle or turn it to energy or turn it to asphalt, turn it to cement, something like that? You can have higher tech ones, which are a bit stronger, but you can see the blatant difference in improvement from bad to good just because you put up a boom. <clears throat> so this is what a lot of the world is facing. And the challenge, again, is how to put some value on this so those people will say, I want to collect it instead of dumping it. <clears throat> we run an event called Plasticity, 
which I launched at the Rio Earth Summit in 2012. We've had almost 10 of them. The next one might be in Paris in June if we get a sponsor to run that. It will, it will take off fast once we do that. Uh, our next one will also be in Malaysia in October. But one of our speakers from Costa Rica has just come out with a new design for lightweight aggregate for cement blocks that is made from dirty plastic. Dirty plastic is this. This will never get recycled but is dirty and it's not like this, which you could call clean because this has a value in the market if people collect it. <clears throat> so imagine you've now got 5% of the dirty aggregate <clears throat> going into a building block, which actually, this is a 2% pile. You'd be having the equivalent of 20 ground up plastic bottles embedded in that building block which is now looking to be LEED certified. If you look at 3.5 tons an hour of machinery in that community to gobble up the dirty stuff, you'd be sucking up 2,500 tons of dirty plastic a year to go into an industry that absolutely needs material, lightweight aggregate, and a good story, which is a green story that says, hey, I'm helping that community and I'm doing something. Uh, so this is one of the super challenges is that it's free to pollute today. Why is it free to pollute? Why do you get to sell your stuff in 80 countries and let them have to deal with how to recycle it? Only 9%, 10% of all the world's plastic ever made is actually recycled. Even though it has a recycling triangle on the bottom, one, two, three, five, six, seven, and the different types, there's actually 40,000 types of plastic they're all within these families. They all can be recycled. But the challenge is getting them into a feedstock stream that is valuable enough for the recycler to care about it and not waste time and money trying to clean it. So if you're a retailer like these guys, why are you still allowed to just let this packaging go out and not try to catch it to come back? This is in Hong Kong. This is totally valuable material. It's totally clean. You could have a bring back program that says bring those apple boxes back to me and you get points and then you stack them up and then the recycler will decide, oh, it's now it's worth my effort to come to your store because you have a pile of 65 of those things every day and that is worth my time and effort to recycle. If, if not, we're carpet bombing the community by sending these things out and putting them in your black plastic bags that no one's going to uncover. So this is a challenge. In, in, in California alone, for the strawberry industry, they use 1.5 billion of these little clamshells. So imagine a world for all of the other salads and sandwiches and fruits that we use, and we're not even really paying attention to recycle them. And they're not recycled content. It's all virgin. So that is another thing that should not be allowed. This should all be recycled content. And, the, and the, re the regulations are often outdated in terms of standardization for food packaging and recycled content, but the technology exists to make this all clean and good. All of these packages are winning awards because they look cool, they're lightweight, good for the carbon, good for the transportation, but none of them can be recycled in 99.9% .9 of the recycling facilities today. And if they are in one state or one city, they're not in all the others. So this is a challenge for the packagers to be a little bit more uh, responsible for what they're putting out. We then launched a, another project at the Clinton Initiative called the Plastic Disclosure Project. And this is very much like carbon and water reporting, which a lot of companies now know how to do. Uh, we are seven years, years too early with this because the world wasn't ready and there was no carbon tax for plastic. We couldn't walk into a company and say, hey, please tell me what you're doing. And they would say, why? No one cares. No one's asking. The press isn't there to push us. And now that vibration and the gravity has changed a bit. So with a circular economy and people thinking about how do I circulate, well, you don't know how to circulate something if you don't manage what you have. So you look at yourself in the mirror and you have to understand how much you put out, how much you recover, how much recycled content you use. And, and this is a huge tool, B2B tool, for companies, institutions, airports, universities. You see Berkeley was the first university in the world to do a full plastic disclosure project for their campus. That's about 40,000 people and it's like a small city. Then you start to understand what you have and that makes it easier <coughs> to then figure out how to fix some, at least of the low-hanging fruit. 
important for investors because more and more investors and pension funds are looking at social responsible investing. They want to know if the managers are doing a good job managing their resources. They want to know if your brand has a liability because that has a name on it when it's in the bushes and in the creek and people start saying that your brand is the one that's causing the problem. With social media now, that's even more and more important. So the investment, op the investment uh, sector is also a big stakeholder in this area. <coughs> the, few main uh, easy areas to make benefit, uh, recycling content increase. All governments should have recycled content mandates in anything they're buying because the people who are really the recyclers are not the people who collect and grind and clean and process. The people who recycle are you, the buyer, because you're creating the market to pull this stuff out of the waste stream and make a new product with it. And so we need companies, we need consumers, we need governments to say we need recycled content. <clears throat> One of the things we did uh, in Hong Kong as a challenge to get companies a little more engaged without having to go to legislation was a bring back program. And many countries and companies could be doing this. So we started the first one in the world for coffee lids. And we said, let's do a program so if people bring their coffee lids in, which are polystyrene plastic, the people will get a little bit of extra uh, drink, a top up on their drink. Uh, we did this for six stores. They didn't believe me that it was going to work. They got good press. And within two weeks, they called me and said, can we do this in China? And that's exactly the kind of call that we want to have happen. Because we broke in, we proved that it can work, and then their mind says, oh, that wasn't so painful. Let's see how we can do it again. So this is in Hong Kong, which is a pretty confined place, but Turkey's pretty tight too. So there's aggregation of material. We have 35 stores now, and now we're collecting it. We're working with the university to grind these into 3D filament so we can print uh, architectural designs with the polystyrene coffee lids. And now everyone's happy, and that's a sexy story. And that's something that can be done over and over in different communities. And of course, we want Starbucks to hear about this and start thinking about that, because then you get big scaled change. We also have a, a kind of a fun little app that we're, that we're creating with a group in Europe, and it was funded by UN. This is our little sample here, the plastic soup. But the app is called My Little Plastic Footprint, and it is basically a little brother of the Plastic Disclosure Project. So if you think of Plastic Disclosure as the B2B version of companies and institutions, this is what you can use for your house and yourself to kind of challenge you on uh, uh, what you're using. There's still a few tweaks coming, but we're here also, uh, in, I swam in the Bosphorus Crossing swim last year, and this year is the 30th anniversary, and we're working with the Olympic Committee and the Bosphorus swimming organizers to make that the first event in Turkey to use the Plastic Disclosure Sport Program, which is like the PDP, but for sports events, because many times you have event organizers in a triathlon, a running race, a biking race, and they don't think about the catering and the plastic from the shirts and all the giveaways and all the stuff they make at an event. So that's pretty cool, and that's coming to Turkey. But here's a nice little ad to sort of tongue in cheek to get you think about the plastic soup. Children and adults from all over delight in the irresistible flavor of the biggest soup in the world, the plastic soup. Prepared only with unnatural ingredients, just like we found it in the oceans. And yes, we followed the most poisonous recipe. With the strongest shopping bags, the most colorful packaging and all kinds of disposable products, and now with even more clothes microfibers. An unwholesome treat for everyone's palates daily eaten by turtles, whales, birds, fish, and even shellfish. Get it now in the 40 gram size, the precise amount of plastic each person dumps into the ocean every month. Give in to the latest trend, the soup to end all soups, and indeed, to end everything and everyone, the plastic soup. Get it now on plasticsoup.info.
So again, that's a, you know maybe a clever new way to, to use marketing and get you you know this is such a complicated issue that we need to fire on all cylinders and all kind of touch points, whether it's kids, uh, government, business, technology, research, recycling. There's plenty of things there. So a few weeks ago, I was in Cambodia. I've been thinking about this for five years. And I finally found uh, my counterpart who lives in Cambodia, a, a, a new colleague. And I said, I need to work with you because I think you know what is going on and how to do things in Cambodia. So we went to Siem Reap, which is a very, uh, which is where Angkor Wat is, a, you know, one of the most amazing UNESCO sites on the planet, uh, all built around water. Yesterday, by the way, was World Water Day. And this lake, a <coughs> thousand years ago, the engineering that they did was all water-based. This lake rises and falls by a factor of six times its size every year. So 2,500 square kilometers to 16,000 square kilometers with an average height of 1.5 meters. So people live on stilts and when the water goes out, all the garbage comes out and sticks in the trees and the people that all the tourists come and they go by this thing. It's like all these bad Christmas trees that have garbage in them as they go out the canal to go to the lake. And I said, Let's, we got to do something about this. So, I found this guy in December and we said, let's try a, a, a sample cleanup. We're not going to tell anyone, we're just going to get a few people and figure this out. <clears throat> and so we went to one of the villages that was kind of controlled by the tourist mafia, which is the ones who take all the money from the tourists but don't give it much back to the community or the people. They don't care about the garbage. If we had gone to them and said, hey, we want to do a cleanup with you, they would have just laughed at us. And so we went, to the, we went to the pagoda, we didn't know anyone, <coughs> and we went in and found the chief monk, and my friend happened to be a monk in the past, so he knew what to do. He got down, talked in the monk talk, and they you know, acknowledged each other, but he still wasn't that excited. There's some white guy there taking a few pictures, and, and, and he didn't really get going until my friend said, well, look at Doug's shirt. It's made from 50% fishing nets and 50% plastic bottles. All these guys fish. And then look at the white shirt. It's made from 100% plastic bottles. And look at his hat. It's made from 100% plastic bottles. And the, and the women over here just started laughing and giggling and saying, what do you mean? All of that stuff out there, we could be turning into some kind of material and make some money from it? And then his eyes lit up and he was like, this is incredible. He saw that there was something for his village. And so he went out, he blessed us, and he, and he got his other five monks. And within an hour, we had them on the riverbank with poles picking plastic out of the trees. And this was the money shot. This was the most amazing thing. And there were boats coming by and they were stopping, wondering why is the monk up on that riverbank in the mud with a pole trying to get plastic out. And so we now have infiltrated this mafia tourist zone that we now plan to go back to because we have full approval of the monks. And when you have that, you can pretty much do anything in, the, in Cambodia. And so we went down and we uh, got to know them. <coughs> and then we went to the next village, which we had planned the next day. I already got approval from the chief of that village. And this is an issue because in Cambodia, the politics is touchy. They don't want some white guys in there with NGOs that are trying to do some things. And so we had 300 kids. The police came on the boat, started picking up the trash with us, as did the monks. And we did this big march, the eco march, down to find more trees and more plastic. And it was an amazing experience. So now the challenge is, Okay, how can we get one of those cement grinding little machines that they can do to at least take all this stuff and make cement because they need cement there like everywhere else. And so this is what the next steps are once we get people thinking about these kind of cleanups. So another thing we do is with theater, I was going to Manila uh, to meet with the government and I thought to myself, how can we get uh, the kids engage when I'm talking to the government about global alert and how to use the app to fix the creeks. And I thought, oh my gosh, <clears throat> they have so many roosters in the Philippines. It's like the national sound. 
And I said, this is what we have to use, the sound of the rooster to remind the kids. And so we created a play called Uncle Roo. In this case, it's Angkor Roo because they're Cambodians. And we now have it in six languages. This is Cambodian group who I found in December. I called them up in January. I said, can you guys come to Malaysia for this big UN Habitat event on sustainable cities? Because they just built us a stage and we needed someone to perform on that stage. And the Cambodian guys said, oh my god, this is the chance of a lifetime for us to perform at this thing for six days, and they did. And the power of this is that, uh, is there audio for that? The power of this play is that every village in the world has a rooster, and we call it eco-repetition, which is the sound of the rooster making a noise every morning. And when the kids have learned that the mother hen died from eating the garbage, because the villagers were polluting. And the Apsara god came back and made her back to life. The rooster was so happy and proud. He was crowing his way around everywhere, reminding the kids to recycle, recycle, put your waste in the right place. So when the kids go home from the village at night and they hear the rooster every day for the next 20 years, they can remember recycle. And so we need you, hopefully, to take this into Turkey and other places we need it in Turkish and we want to have a play or a show or a puppet show here that we can use to spread the word. So I'm almost done here but a couple of things on the uh, plastic that the climate change angle doesn't have with climate. A company can say oh yeah we reduce our climate uh, carbon by 10 percent. You could say oh yeah where is it? I, I don't know. I can't see it or touch it. But with a lot of products that are garbage today there's a brand image and a brand related to that. And that is a different power than you have with carbon and climate. And with social media now, this is a new area. And we're not saying that everyone needs to be called out, but the brands and the companies need to be starting to realize they need to be engaged in this discussion with their community, with the people they serve, having recycled content, having bring back programs, using the reverse supply chain to get material, using biomaterial, <clears throat> and remember that every piece of plastic that ever became garbage pretty much left someone's hand before it became garbage, which means it's only this far away. The problem is the infrastructure in most countries doesn't exist for it to go to the right place. So it's not just all of our fault. It's, this is a very much a company-related issue. Most governments do not have the power or the long-standing duration in their job to make the right legislation that really trigger all of the changes we need in this very complicated space. So we really need companies to get up in front and, and be proud of what they're doing and making a difference. So this is about plasticity. I talked about that already. But um, be happy to answer any questions and thank you very much for having me today. Question way in the back. Well, I was wondering whether do you think like reuse of plastic material is enough as a solution, or we need like a gradual shift? Um, uh, well, uh, I forgot my question. No, you're, you're asking about <laughs> uh, is reusing plastic enough, or do, do we you need think to shift away from plastic? Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. do we need to shift uh, from plastic as a material? Uh, completely or reuse of the material is going to be enough? Uh, it has to be a little bit of everything. So the stupid plastic needs to be gotten rid of. So the stupid plastic is the single-use disposables that is made to last for 400 years, but you use it for 20 seconds to stir your coffee or eat a yogurt. That is not necessary. Uh, I talked at a big textile company, big brand that you all will know the name of in the US to a group like you, and that person said to all of his employees, he got up and said, you know what, guys? We ship ourselves 27 million t-shirts every year, and every single one comes in a poly bag. And that poly bag is never seen by the customer because we take it off before the customer even gets it. So they ship themselves 27 million bags a year. Now that is just one smart thought to re-engineer that system in the supply chain. If you don't start looking at yourself in the mirror, you won't get that. But 
medical equipment, airplane parts. The, the big challenge is going to be nanomaterials. How do you recycle the nanomaterials? Chemical recycling will come, which means you can put it into a liquid and it will dissolve and then you get the new things again. So biomaterial should be coming. So there's a difference between the petroleum and the bio, which should be non-food based, but it could be algae and, and all of that. So there's a lot of things that have to happen, but we'll never just get rid of it. We need it for too many things. I mean, climate change actually kind of was a problem because we pushed down on the climate change, said we're going to lightweight, 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 and have less transportation. Everyone moved to plastic, and then plastic went up like this, but no one ever thought about all that stuff that was now plastic and how to get rid of it. <coughs> so, um, you know, we have to figure out that balance. So the question is, there feedback from petrochemical guys? Uh, they have the World Plastic Council, uh, which is all of the big plastic makers. I'm apparently the only person they've led into their annual meeting in 25 years who, who's not from the plastic industry uh, because they liked a few things I was saying without bashing them on the head. The World Plastic Council. They have all kinds of uh, cleanup projects and programs and all of this around the world, but. Is it enough? Is it the right scale? Is it the right size? Probably not. The problem with the petrochemical industry is that they're too far removed from your and my touch point and knowledge. They just make the polymers and they just make the material. It's the users who then make a bottle or a toy or a shoe or a car part. Those are the ones that we see. And so the petrochemical guys don't exactly feel the pressure on this necessarily just yet, but they know that this is a big issue and they have to be in the game. So uh, they're watching, but they haven't sort of come up and said, I'm, I'm the new hero on the block yet. I wish they would. Well, I, I attended a, a sales meeting of, a, of one major petrochemical company that I happen to be selling their stuff here. And I heard that they are triggered and concerned. Right. And they see that this will affect and put an impact on their future investments. Right. Well, if they're that's smart, that's they'd be that. investing in the solutions, not in the old machinery that's keeping them going the way they used to go in the past. That's, that's the problem. So they need to get on to the new game and the new energy and the new technologies. They need to be doing the biofuel algae made stuff. But they just don't want their old machinery to go defunct because it doesn't do anything anymore. But you've got to have, uh, yeah. But they're coming. They, they, they know that. Some of them are faster than others. The problem, one of the big problems is fracking. Fracking um, makes it too easy to make cheap fuel and gas, and therefore it's easier to make virgin material. So the challenge with recycling is the cost. Cannot compete with virgin material at least when the oil price is about where it is today. If it's 120 a barrel, then it starts competing and people want it. So we have to use different uh, economic drivers, either a cost, a tax, a fee, or other public incentive that says, I just want recycled content <coughs> instead of the virgin stuff. In Asia and some parts of the world, the companies don't want to talk about recycled content because they're afraid the public doesn't want to buy it because they're afraid it's not new, it's not fresh, it's not clean, it's going to break down. So that's a public perception, that's a marketing problem. But the challenge with recycling, I mentioned this before, it's the same analogy as reconstituting an omelet. So if someone says to you, make an omelet with eggs, cheese, bacon, pepper, mushroom, Okay, now reconstitute it back to the original form. That's what recycling is like. It's that complicated. Mainly because our collection point process is not right. It's not correct in this day and age for the material. You cannot co-mingle and put all your stuff in one plastic bag and expect someone on the other end to economically be able to pull it apart and clean it and put all the plastics in the right order so that some other guy can buy it and make use of it. Way too expensive. So one of the things that we promote, that, that I'm promoting, is uh, it's simple for the whole planet to understand, sort by wet and dry. Because if you have dry stuff, anyone in the sorting facility can get the plastic, paper, metal, glass, everything, and it's not contaminated. Much more value. And the wet stuff can be done much better because you can compost it, you can do other things. 
and that doesn't have plastic in it. And you reduce the methane that's going in the landfill because now you don't have to put it in the landfill. That's another big thing that we don't even talk about. So this is the challenge with the petroleum that they're at an advantage because of subsidies, low price, low oil price. People want virgin, it's quick, easy. Yeah, so um, that's why we need their help in uh, moving the dial a bit. Someone over here? Back there? Uh, we are organizing a, a congress called Student Congress on uh, Current Topics in Environmental S Science. Uh, it held in University of Istanbul. Uh, it's organized to share cultural, social, and uh, scientific issues are as related to uh, environment and contemporary environmental uh, studies. And this year, our main topics are plastics, uh, rene renewable energy and uh, biodiversity. Uh, what would you like to say about these three topics and uh, our organization, of course, and uh, organizations as like this? Uh, and with your permission, I uh, would like to share your opinion in our Congress. <laughs> we'll have a million more of them <laughs> and get a million more people to go to them because those are all the topics that need to be talked about. Um, you know, going back to the oil industry, uh, the the cement company in Panama and Costa Rica that's now buying the dirty plastic for the cement aggregate just did the contract said we're going to buy 100% of everything you make. And they put solar panels on their uh, little factory to run the machine to do the plastic that goes into the cement. So these things all link together. You know the ecosystem is being tarnished by the polluted water, the overfishing links, you know all this is connected. So the oil companies could be part of these new machines. I didn't even talk about plastic to fuel, which to me is a huge needed opportunity. A lot of environmentalists immediately jump, unfortunately, at the thought of incineration or waste to energy or waste to fuel. And I say that is a huge detriment to the whole issue because there's no way in the world that we're going to go from zero to 100 in 100 years to get all of the inventory of all the plastic out there that already exists and recycle all of it. And there's no way we can go back to zero and have no plastic. So we have to deal with what is out there. We have to recover it. And using it for fuel, for dirty plastic, or for cement, or for asphalt, is the whole new space, which will give the petroleum guys a lot more room to maneuver. If they're in the game, they can be part of it. If they want to sit aside and wait till they get old, they cannot be part of it. But you know, this is the, this is the opportunity. So um, plastic to fuel is a liquefaction of the plastic into a diesel, mostly diesel. It could be refined or whatever. <coughs> plastic doesn't have sulfur in it, so you get a low sulfur content. And in most countries in the world, they're selling dirty diesel for their boats and their generators and their trucks. And that is bad for air pollution. So why not have cleaner diesel made from garbage that's going into a diesel engine that is still exists. If you get rid of all the diesel engines on the planet, then yeah, we shouldn't have these machines and we shouldn't even make the fuel. But at least if we're gonna have the diesel engines, let's at least use these machines to digest and make some fuel from. One more? One more, perhaps. One more? You want it? Do you want it? Yes. <laughs> I'm happy to stand around and talk afterwards because you guys are a good audience. Okay. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I do appreciate a lot win-win um, solutions and all kinds of <coughs> innovative sort of attempts that um, um, you have been through. Um, but don't you think that at the end of the day we pollute because it's cheap? Um, so. Back to the question of uh, petrochemicals, um, do you think that, um, overall speaking, there is a huge sort of political economy type of uh, pressure onto us by the industry so as so that we can't put a heavy tax on the production of plastic? Uh, I know what you're trying to say, and I agree. Yeah, yes, of course, <laughs> of course. 
but I'm trying to get at it a different way. I mean, yes, we need a fee. You should, it, pollution should not be free. You should pay to play. If you're gonna sell something, you should pay to sell in into the market. If you're gonna carpet bomb the planet with your products and into 100 countries and they can't handle it, you should pay some money into the system to be able to get that out. Taiwan does that very well. It's called the EPR law, but some countries now have it, extended producer responsibility. And this is the new era. It's the same as a carbon tax. If you're gonna use it, you need to do something to help offset it. So Taiwan, they put a little charge on everything. It's fair, the whole market has it. There's no one who's losing out different from anyone else. Easy, all the money goes into the system for the grinders, the shredders, the collectors, the reprocessor, new industry, new innovation, new recycled content. If you don't put the money in the game, it will never ever happen. So there's two things that have to happen. You have to charge on waste, disposal, if there's no charges on landfills or anything that wants people to get people to avoid just freely dumping, we'll solve nothing. So you need to charge at the waste side and we need to charge at the production side. Now they'll say, oh, then my consumers are too poor and they can't afford it and all of that. Well, they're basically putting the cost of their profits. They're internalizing their profits at our expense externalizing the cost to us and our community by having the taxpayers and the government deal with that stuff. So why don't we get them to pay for it at the front end where it's more economical, more efficient, it will allow them to reduce a lot of the excesses anyway, and then, then we can solve this. So we definitely need both sides of that. Yeah, one more? One more quickly. First of all, I want to add something to, uh, about your question and ask a relevant question. Maybe you might be missing uh, the customer preference. Uh, for example, l recently Puma uh, gave their uh, information about their supply chain. Like they address, they started to address their uh, sub uh, supply chain based. Uh, uh, environmental impact so that uh, they can say give purchase our products so we can control it better so if uh, about this uh, process what do you think the impact of the uh, supply chain to like C2C uh, communication what do you think uh, it will affect to this uh, environmental process so, so you mean that uh, Puma's transparent reporting mm -hmm. on the, what they use in the supply chain impacts the consumers and the consumers will want to buy Puma more yeah. rather than the other brand. Mm -hmm. So that's what your question is? Yeah, and how do you think this process, like C2C communication about this environmental impact will be shaped in the future? Well, I think with social media these days, there's so much more power to be able to do that. So if, if if consum consumers have power, you, you have the ability to walk into a store and buy that thing which is packaged in junk or buy that thing which is packaged more naturally and you can do that. So if you also want to invest in a company as a big social responsible investor or pension fund or a personal investor, you might want to know if that company has good supply chain, they, they treat their water, their labor, their environment, in a better way, that, that is definitely coming. Uh, Larry Fink from BlackRock, the biggest investor in the world, uh, right before the World Economic Forum a month or two ago, put out a letter to all CEOs and said something that I've actually been saying in many of my talks, that if you are a company and you're not engaged in the community you serve and proving to them that you're doing it, which is much more than a little CSR activity to put a little photo in your annual report and say we had a kids cleanup yesterday and look how nice we are. The companies don't get really engaged in this in the transparent reporting. We're not gonna invest in your company because you're probably not doing the right thing. And that has a lot of power. And many CEOs were like, oh, what does that mean to us? But that's good. I mean, this is where the world's going. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, happy to answer more questions.